Good morning. I guess that I guess it's on, huh? Um, I, I first would like to thank uh, Source Boston for uh, inviting me here to speak. Um, I'm unsure if it was uh, my position as the industry director for information technology, or they thought that Tito Jackson from the Jackson 5 was me. I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure. But either way, I feel very privileged and honored uh, to be here today. Um, again, my name is Tito Jackson, and I represent the Massachusetts Office of Business Development. And we're the governor's uh, business development arm. Our objective is to help companies in the state of Massachusetts grow um, and to remove obstacles and also remove the uh, the um, air of it not being a, a positive business place to be. Um, we are very, very business friendly and uh, Governor Patrick really understands um, how important business is to driving the economy in the state of Massachusetts. Um, first, I wanted to thank uh, Stacy Thayer. Can we give it up again for Stacy? <laughs> Um, it's, it's a monumental event to uh, pull off um, something new uh, in, in the state of Massachusetts, so we, we'd like to, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, um, but we, we'd like to give her, um, you know, a, 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 our support and also uh, continued support in the, in the years to come. Uh, I just wanted to um, expand on what the information and communication technology industry means to the state of Massachusetts. Um, obviously, post-bubble, uh, uh, we had some, a, a great deal of job loss. But uh, in the past year, since Governor Patrick has taken office, uh, we've increased jobs by 21,000 uh, new jobs, net new jobs. Can we give it up for that? OK. Um, and uh, that actually moved us from uh, 48th in job growth to 15th in job growth. So that's pretty good year over the year, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and obviously, this is not uh, only due to our administration. This is really due to the strong industry of resilient people that are here. We actually have over 175,000 uh, people who work in the information and communication technology industry in the state of Massachusetts. And it represents over $26 billion uh, to the state. So I know oftentimes we've uh, recently heard about the medical device uh, and, and life science industry um, as well as other industries, but we realize that the information and communication technology industry is very, very important. And I feel like there's three pillars um, to the, uh, the industry here. One is the business, and we've talked about that. But we also have some pretty good schools around here. We have uh, over uh, 430,000 college students. Uh, we are the most educated state. We have the highest percentage of bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, as well as computer science and electric, electrical engineering uh, degrees. And I only, I only fit in the first category, so you guys need to give yourself a round of applause for the second two categories. Um, and with those colleges um, brings a great deal of brain trust. Uh, we obviously know we have the MITs, the Harvards, and the BUs, as well as the BCs. But um, I must note that we have a very, very strong public educational system. And uh, most recently, we've had the uh, Nobel, Nobel Prize awarded to a faculty member at UMass, at Craig, uh, that being uh, Professor Craig Mello. And so that is a reflection of not only our private institutions, but also our public institutions. And the third pillar, I would say, um, that we have a great deal of strength in is the venture capital community. We actually have some dollars uh, here in the state of Massachusetts. The New England Venture Capital Association has $50 billion under management. And Massachusetts actually ranks number two to some state out west. Um, I, don't know what, I don't know about that state, but um, it, <laughs> it, uh, it ranks number two to uh, California in terms of dollars invested by uh, VCs. And mind you, they're a bigger brother. They, they are six times our size. So uh, per capita, we do very well. Um, so I, I just wanted to let you know that, um, as you probably already know, the information and communication technologies industry is alive and well in the state of Massachusetts. And we are here to support it. And we are committed to the growth of this industry in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and just a couple of initiatives that are uh, going on right now. 
Uh, the governor is very interested in STEM education, um, that of science, technology, engineering, and math for young people. And uh, recently, he's announced a matching grant for uh, companies who are supporting a student. Um, there's a, a grant of 500, th excuse me, 500, uh, excuse me, 5,000. I was going to say 500000 That would have been bad, and his camera's up there. Okay. <laughs> Retract the $500,000. $5,000 per year um, with a maximum of $10,000 uh, to help students who are interested in science, technology, engineering, and math, which is pretty good. Um, in addition, there is a readiness uh, program where we're looking at K-12 through education. And uh, this will be announced in the spring. And ironically, we actually have, as a co-chair, um, uh, Joe Tucci from EMC. So we have pulled in and, and are very um, interested in having public-private partnerships when it comes to our education uh, system. And one more, uh, the governor announced a $2.5 billion bond bill for capital improvement, uh, which includes $450 million to upgrade the government IT networks, as well as $78 million for a new data warehousing center over a five-year period. And this is a, a new commitment um, that we have to the infrastructure. Um, and trust me, um, it is very, very, very antiquated um, in which we are now stringing together legacy systems, um, and we definitely need to, to upgrade. Um, and at a time of uh, some of some economic uh, instability nationally, um, this would definitely help our economy. Um, so I just wanted to give you a, a, a state, of, state of the state of uh, information and communication technology uh, quickly. Again, I would like to uh, thank Stacy um, for putting together this, con uh, this conference. And um, I am going to get off the stage. You have a very, very, very um, uh, famous as well as uh, well-regarded speaker who's going to come on after me. Um, Richard Clark is an internationally recognized expert on security, including homeland security, national security, cybersecurity, and counterterrorism. He is currently chairman of Good Harbor Consulting and an on-air uh, consultant for ABC, in which he looks very handsome when he's on TV. Um, and I'm going to actually jump off the stage and uh, turn it over to Richard Clark. Please give it up for Richard Clark, everyone. Good afternoon. It's good to be home. Yes, home. I was born here, Cambridge, up the street. It's also good to be out of Washington. And no, I am not client number eight. <laughs> Just get that out of the way. Washington's a strange town. Evidently, New York is too, but. Uh, what has happened in Washington over the course of the last year in the area of cybersecurity is kind of, kind of fascinating. Many of you will recall, because you were part of it, that beginning around 1998, uh, the White House focused national attention, government attention, and industry attention on cybersecurity, held a, uh, the first ever White House summit on national uh, security and commerce implications of cybersecurity uh, in 1999. No, I think that was 2000. That was in 2000. Held a series of town hall meetings across the country to develop a national strategy for cyberspace security. More than doubled the amount of money being spent on cybersecurity quadrupled the amount of money being spent on cybersecurity R&D. And then the Bush administration came into office. And it didn't quite get the whole thing about cybersecurity. Because it didn't go bang. And there weren't body bags associated with it. So the issue kind of dropped down the list of government priorities, as did things like funding for cyberspace security R&D, as did the rank in the government of the person in charge of cybersecurity, 
In fact, the rank of the person in charge of cybersecurity dropped so low that no one knew who it was anymore. And then came 2007. A couple of little things happened in 2007. In fact, you can think about them, two of the more important things as the E, the E phenomenon, because they both begin with E. One was Estonia. What happened in Estonia, not terribly different than what happened elsewhere earlier, but it caught the attention of Washington because it involved Russia, something that the White House does focus on. And for those of you who don't know what happened in Estonia, I will do a brief review. In 1945, the Red Army liberated Estonia, or in the view of the Estonians, occupied Estonia. And they stayed there for 45 years. Their most notable accomplishment, uh, the Russians, was to build a giant memorial of themselves. Uh, so there was a giant statue of a Red Army soldier in a prominent square in downtown Estonia. Estonians would point this out uh, in an embarrassed way to tourists and say, yeah, that's the only member of the Red Army that didn't rape anybody when they came here in 1945. It was not something that the Estonians were proud of. So having been an independent country for a while, and having joined NATO, they finally had the temerity to get rid of the statue. And this caused the Russians no end of heartburn. Diplomatic notes were sent back and forth. Protests were held, uh, not in Estonia, in Moscow. Uh, and when none of that worked, and the Estonians actually moved the statue, somebody launched a cyber war against little Estonia. Now, it wasn't a sophisticated cyber war. You all could probably have done a better job. But then again, the Russians didn't want to reveal too many of their toolkit items. So basically, they did a denial of service attack on the banking system of Estonia, on the government ministries in Estonia, not for a couple of hours or a couple of days, but for weeks on end. And of course, wanting everybody to know who it was that did it, they made no attempt to hide their traces. And it was easily traced back to servers in Moscow. Estonia was now part of NATO. And so all the NATO countries, uh, through diplomatic the marshmallows at the Russians and said, this is very bad. We have traced it back to your, to your servers. And the government of Vladimir Putin said, well, it may be on servers in Moscow, but what makes you think that we have any control over what people do in Russia? Guess the KGB is not what it used to be. But that focused the attention of people in Washington, at least people in the Pentagon and in the White House, to this whole cyber security thing again. And they started dusting off studies from the Clinton administration. And then the second thing, beginning with the letter E, happened. Those of you who've been to the Pentagon know that it's Pentagon because it's five-sided, but it's also a Pentagon because it's five buildings, five five-sided buildings, one inside the other, like a Russian Matryoshka doll. And the outermost building is called the E-ring. The innermost building is called the A-ring. Work it out. The outermost building, the E-ring, is where the Secretary of Defense, now Robert Gates, has his office. And what happened on the E-ring including apparently to Robert Gates's office, uh, was that someone hacked the system. Uh, someone was really in control of the system, had administrative privileges, and if some rumors are to be believed, managed to get from the unclassified network into the classified network. Now, that would be a problem 
because the Pentagon's entire strategy for the next several decades is something called net-centric warfare, where everybody has multiple IP addresses, IP addresses for their gun, for their helmet, for their radio, for the, and the whole bloody army, Air Force and everything, is all netted together in one great cyber cloud, which is, of course, highly secure. <laughs> Not. About 10 years ago, they took the USS Yorktown, which was, a, I think, a cruiser or a destroyer, a big boat, took it out uh, for sea trials off the coast of Virginia. And they had this idea, part of the net-centric warfare thing, that they would use a commercial off-the-shelf COTS operating system to master control the entire destroyer. Anybody want to finish the story? <laughs> so the tug eventually arrived and pulled the destroyer back in to the harbor. That little escapade of the Yorktown is a metaphor, I think, in many ways, for where the Pentagon and U.S. national security may be going as we rely on net-centric warfare and don't have the systems secured. You see, the USS Yorktown was named after a place where the dominant military power of the world was defeated. If we don't get cybersecurity right, in some future conflict, all of our great sophisticated ships and airplanes and tanks will roll out onto the battlefield and freeze up because somebody will have gotten into the software. And there's reason to believe that that may already have happened if the rumors are true that, in fact, the Chinese government has been in our classified networks. Now, with the case of Estonia, the Russian government said, oh, it's just individual Russians. It's not the government. In the case of the Chinese attacks that have been taking place over many years, but have become so very clear in the last year, it appears very much to be the Chinese government. And I'm not saying that. Other governments are. The German government announced the Chinese government had hacked into the office of the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel. The British government, British Security Service, MI5, announced in a confidential circular to the 300 largest companies in the UK that they had reason to believe that the Chinese government had hacked into the networks of those 300 largest companies in the UK. A Defense Science Board report issued last year said specifically the Chinese government was attempting to hack into not only the classified networks of the Pentagon, but the classified networks of defense contractors such as Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, etc. So what used to be called paranoia uh, or fiction, for those of you who read my last novel, Breakpoint, now available in paperback, <laughs> a little plot about how the Chinese hacked their way into the Pentagon. Uh, it's now, I think, pretty much officially stated that we're facing a state sponsored cyber threat to the classified systems of the U.S. government and to the private sector corporate world. If you needed any evidence more than those press reports or than those government reports, go to Best Buy and buy a picture frame. <laughs> For those of you who don't know that reference, 
uh, we discovered last month that one particular brand of picture frame, digital picture frame, being sold at Best Buy throughout the country. Uh, while you download your pictures of loved ones and pets uh, onto the digital picture frame, it uploads a Trojan into your computer. <laughs> Trojan that looks for your password and stealthily emails it back to the country of origin of the picture frame. Not Canada. <laughs> so, all of this has caused the sleeping giant of the United States government to wake up, uh, smell the Red Bull, and start to do something about it. So on January 8th, uh, the esteemed President of the United States signed a National Security Presidential Directive, which hasn't gotten much play because they didn't tell anybody. But it directs billions of dollars, billions of new dollars, into several initiatives uh, to achieve cybersecurity. Since it's not public, we can only go on the Washington rumor mill about exactly what's in the document. But the Washington rumor mill says it emphasizes two things. First of all, securing the government's own computer networks. And secondly, going on the offense in cyber war and a little bit more emphasis in research and development. Now that kind of sounds okay, if a little less than comprehensive, but there may be some problems. And since they're not really showing it around to everybody, it's difficult to know and difficult to criticize. But a couple of thoughts. First, securing the government networks stems from an, a, an idea, a conception of cyberspace that somehow there are government networks. And there really aren't. You know, there may be a .gov domain name, but there's no .gov environment. And all of those .gov sites are running through the same network of routers, the same fiber optic uh, channels as the porn and the Amazon and the email and everything else. It's not segregated. The government has contracts with AT&T and Verizon and Global Crossing and Level 3 and all of the other carriers, and the government traffic isn't segregated on them. So either they don't know that and somehow think that all they have to do is you know, reinforce the firewalls and, and the on-site servers and the, and the data that they have on their own facilities, in which case they're missing most of the problem. Or they intend to do monitoring, perhaps at line rate, over at fat pipes, of everything that's going through their carrier's system. And if they're going to do that without warrants, well, that doesn't seem to bother them not having warrants, but it bothers me, and I think it should bother all of us. We should ask questions about the privacy implications of this new presidential initiative. How are they going to secure government networks without looking at all of the traffic that's going over all of the networks? And if they're doing that, how are they ensuring our privacy rights and our civil liberties? You know, years ago I would not have worried about that. But given this government's performance with the abuse of the Patriot Act, the abuse of the FISA court and the surveillance laws, I think we have to ask these questions. And we can no longer assume that our government isn't violating the law. We can no longer assume that our government isn't violating our privacy rights and our civil liberties. 
So that's the first set of problems that comes out of this initiative for me. The second set is this notion that somehow we can solve this problem by our going on the offensive. Maybe if we hack them or sell them picture frames, <laughs> that it'll all go away. Now, part of the reason I worry about this is some of the people behind this thinking, um, say, the National Security Advisor, Secretary of State, others, grew up in the Cold War. Well, I did too. But they seem somehow still to be in the Cold War, preserved in amber somehow, in about 1989. And they're applying, many people are, Cold War strategic nuclear doctrine thinking to this new world of cyberspace and cyber war. And it kind of doesn't work. Because in the nu strategic nuclear era, we had something called, appropriately enough, MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. And the concept was, you nuke me, I'll nuke you back. Only more so. Maybe that worked. But if it did, it worked because we both knew the other guy had nuclear weapons. They'd both blown them up in the atmosphere, underground. They demonstrated their missiles worked. They demonstrated their bombs worked. In cyberspace, who knows what capability anybody has? Who knows what you could really do? If you really launched a cyber attack on the United States, how much of it could you shut down? If you really launched one on Russia or China, how much could you really shut down? And what would be the effect on the country? I suspect that the United States is more vulnerable than other countries because we are more dependent on cyberspace. We are more wired than other countries. We have more portals coming into the United States. China, for example, has now structured its cyberspace so it can shut it off, so that it can close the finite number of portals that it has to the rest of the world and create its own cyber environment not connected to the rest of the world if it wants to. So it seems to me that there are some asymmetries here. That we may be less able to attack the enemy. We may be more vulnerable ourselves if there is a cyber war. And there's a great deal of uncertainty about how capable we are or even how capable the enemy is. Which means all these nice doctrines from the 1970s and 80s about strategic nuclear war don't really apply. And before we run off and spend many billions of dollars creating a cyber warfare offensive capability, wouldn't it be nice if we knew what we were doing first? Wouldn't it be nice if we began by figuring out what's the doctrine, what's the strategy, and what capabilities do we want to have, and what are the risks involved? And answer some fundamental questions about the role of government. One of the most fundamental questions is, if the government becomes aware of a vulnerability in an operating system or an application, who should it tell and when? And right now, there are a lot of people in government who think when they find a vulnerability, that that's great because they can use it to hack into some other country's network. And there is no law, there is no executive order, there's no rule that says when the government finds that vulnerability, it needs to tell you and me. Well, it's just possible that if the United States government can figure out the vulnerability, other people can too. 
Maybe even people in Cambridge. Maybe even people in Bulgaria and Nigeria and all the other little hacker dens around the world. Why, if the United States government knows that there's a risk to your system, your network, shouldn't it have an obligation to tell you? What's more important, protecting our own networks or hacking into somebody else's? For me, that's a no-brainer. For me, the answer is obvious. We need to tell our hospitals, our financial markets, our universities, our corporations, as soon as we know about vulnerabilities. You may want to wait a day or two or a week or two to get the patch ready first, but you have an obligation, I think, and I think it should be a legal obligation to notify people in the United States because the first duty of government is to protect and defend its own people. Those big picture questions, those fundamental issues need to be clarified, publicly debated, and decided before we run off creating some great new cyber offensive capability. I don't know how many of you have seen the new Air Force ads. Pretty slick. They have put cyberspace uh, on par with aerospace and outer space. Now, for a bunch of fighter jocks who run the Air Force to put cyberspace on an equal footing for the United States Air Force with places where you can fly F-15s, that's a big change, very big change. But all their advertising, all their recruiting now is focusing equally on cyberspace. With the staff sergeants, sure. It's all, all staff sergeants. Everybody gets to be a staff sergeant right away. But this, this advertising campaign is so pervasive that it resulted in a little pop-up ad on my computer the other day. Yes, I don't have the software that kills pop-up ads. Um, but this little pop-up ad said, sometimes a blackout is just a blackout. In the future, it could be cyber war, United States Air Force. I thought, are they targeting me? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's at least good to know that some part of the US government has figured out that you can cause a blackout through cyber attack. It's kind of too bad that that hasn't really sunk in in the people who regulate our power system. And that brings me to my final thought, which is one of the missing elements in the president's cyber initiative is, it's a dirty word in Washington. It's the R word. No, not recession. That's another dirty little R word that we're not in, really. Not yet, later. The R word is regulation. Regulation to Washington bureaucrats, Washington politicians, is inherently a bad thing. Just ask them. Just say the word regulation. Half the Congress will run down the hall the other way. No, oh, no, not regulation. Yeah, they hate it. They think all regulation is bad. Any proposal to create new regulation, no matter what it is, they instantly reject. You could do a lot to achieve cybersecurity in the United States through smart regulation, light-handed regulation, regulation that set goals end states, didn't tell you necessarily how to achieve it, regulation developed out of best practices, regulation developed with a dialogue with academic and industry experts. One of the things that they really don't like the thought of is regulating the internet. That's an abhorrent thought. But think about what you could do to eliminate worms and viruses 
and DDoS attacks and spam and phishing and child porn. If you required the ISPs to do that. Now, when we first had this thought five years ago, it wasn't possible to actually pull that off. But I would offer to you today that it's possible today to achieve probably 80 to 90% effectiveness by requiring all the ISPs to do that. Now, will that result in the ISPs spending more money and therefore charging a little bit more? Perhaps. Perhaps. But if all the ISPs are required to do it, it'll be an even playing field, it'll be passed on to the consumer, and frankly, you won't feel the pinch. But you might feel the benefit. Regulation. And perhaps we should even think a really, truly dangerous thought, that we might want to have regulation about the quality of computer code that the government buys. If the government set standards and said, we're only going to buy computer code in the future that meets some academic industry standard for safety, security, reliability, and that that standard would get better over time, like the CAFE standards for auto emission. It just might create some market forces that would result in R&D going into better ways of writing computer code, more secure ways of writing computer code, and R&D and procurement of products that check to see if code is in fact secure. Do those two things. Regulate the ISPs for security. Create regulations about what the government will buy in the way of secure code. And a lot of this problem, a lot of this problem gets smaller. But neither of those two ideas are in the president's plan, I'm told. So we may just have to wait a year. Thanks very much. Thank you. It's been an honor to have you here. I uh, appreciate it. So now, um, as you see, according to the schedules, the breakout sessions, uh, this is one room. The Cambridge room is on the second floor, and the Paul Revere room is by the entrance. So we'll have people there to direct you. Um, yeah, I have a little bit of time. So there's also the lounge and vendor room next door. Thank you.